Well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back to Australia too. You were out here, what, about 12 months, two years ago? Yes, that's right. Was that Life of Brian time or something? Life of Brian and, uh, oh, in a book that I wrote, that's right. Oh, yeah. right, right, mm -hmm. right. Now, Yellow Beard opened at the weekend to very good business mm -hmm. all around the country. And uh, just tell people about the idea of Yellow Beard. Yellow Beard is sort of a, a vaguely nasty... Well, not vaguely, he's very nasty. Very nasty. Really, yes, the most unpleasant pirate ever, really. Mm. He'd uh, poke your eyes out as soon as look at you, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. just an all-round nasty one. Yes, oh yes, no where, redeeming where the, feature at all. Where did the idea come from? Uh, actually, it was Keith Moon, uh, an old drinking companion of mine, some right. years ago, about six years ago, suggested I wrote an adventure comedy. And looking at Keith, he reminded me uh, in, a, uh, in appearance of, um, uh, in Treasure Island, uh, Long John Silver, played by Robert Newton, yeah. right? Looked just like him. And also Keith rather behaved like a pirate. He did whatever he felt like doing on the spur of the moment and didn't give a damn about the consequences, yeah. which is very piratical yeah. in behavior. So that gave me the idea of, of pirates and that uh, was the seed of it really. Uh -huh. And uh, started to write it some time later. Uh, did yeah. you have Keith Moon in mind for the part? Uh, he would indeed have been uh, in the movie, yes, either playing Yellowbeard himself or, uh, or his arch uh, rival, uh, who in fact we named Moon uh, after him. Oh, yeah. really? In memory? Yeah. He, he must have been outrageous, was he? He threw grand pianos into swimming pools and all sorts of things. That kind of thing, yes, even on, the, on a smaller scale. I once went to see him in his hotel in London. Actually, there was only one hotel which would accept him at the time. <laughs> uh, he was banned from most of the rest. He was staying there under the name of uh, Mr. Rupert Wilde, which was kind of ominous anyway. <laughs> and uh, I used to drink gin at the time, large quantities of it. Uh, stopped five years ago, had to. But um, uh, there was no gin in uh, Keith's uh, penthouse apartment in this hotel. He was right up there on the, the top floor. And uh, so he rang up room service and asked them if they could send up a bottle of gin. And 15 minutes later, they, uh, they still hadn't. And so Keith rang them back and said that uh, if the gin didn't arrive within the next 10 minutes, their television set would arrive on the pavement outside. Uh, 10 minutes later, still no gin had arrived, and uh, Keith disappeared out of the window, which I thought was kind of odd. Uh, I thought he probably walked onto the balcony, yeah. but, but it was kind of 13, 14 floors high. Uh, a few minutes later, I looked out just to check, and there was no balcony. Uh, there was, in fact, a small ledge about four or five inches wide, uh, there was no mess on the pavement underneath, <coughs> check that. Uh, so he obviously crawled along, somehow or other, managed to crawl along this balcony. Uh, there was no other sign of him. So I just sat down and waited, knowing Keith, expecting the unexpected, as it were. And um, a few minutes later, he came back into the room through the window with a bottle of gin in his hand. He'd burgled the next door penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> a good friend, a good friend. <laughs> What age did he make, Grant? Hmm? What age did he get to? 32? 34. 34, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Packed a lot in there, though, didn't oh, he? Oh, he certainly did, yeah. Now, uh, uh, despite his absence and the, uh, the fact that you've named someone in memory of him in the film, you've still got a wonderful collection of people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. You've got everyone from the respectable to the absolute gore blimey. <laughs> That's right, yes. We were very lucky. Really, uh, when we were writing, uh, Peter Cook and I, we uh, bore certain characters in mind because it helps when you're writing to have an idea of... Right. Possibly, not who might play it, but just as a character. It helps you form that character. Uh, and most of them said yes. So, have got an embarrassment, really, of... Uh, just rattle through who you've got for people. You've got... Uh, well, apart from yourself. Apart from myself, from yeah. Python, we have uh, John Cleese appearing as Blind Pew. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Eric Idle uh, yeah. as well. And then there's a kind of... Um, uh, uh, Mel Brooks set, really, right. as well, with Marty Feldman, uh, Peter Boyle, Madeleine Kahn, <laughs> and uh, Kenneth Mars. Yeah. And then the, uh, the Cheech and Chong set with Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Which is yeah, enough. So <laughs> that, that's about the first group. time they've done a film, apart from their own strange ones. Yes, it is. It's the first time they've had lines to learn, as well. Yeah, they, yeah. I can believe that. They just make things <laughs> yes. up as they go along. <laughs> they wouldn't have a clue what they've made up, would they? They found it an interesting process, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, Marty Feldman, yeah. I, I believe he's wonderful. And I, I, I walked in the other day when it was running, and I just saw a little bit of it, and there were Marty's two wonderful eyes bulging, and I thought, I've got to come back and see this. I mean, right. they seem as far apart as ever, and it was his last film. Yes, yes, sadly, <coughs> his last film. I was uh, very pleased that he agreed to, to appear in it. Uh, I mean, he, I've worked with Marty and known him for many years. He started off, in fact, in television uh, in a little show called At Last, the 1948 Show, with John Cleese and myself right. many years ago, yeah. about uh, 18 years ago, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was very pleased that he... Uh, agreed to come back and uh, actually jokingly at the beginning of filming said that John and uh, myself started his career it looked as though he might finish it which is that kind of 
yes. sad on reflection. Yeah, I don't want to get maudlin about it, but yeah. uh, he didn't die during the shoot, he died no, just no. straight afterwards. Didn't That's he? right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was on very good form, I'm glad to say, because he, he kind of sad the last couple of years before that, which is why I was very keen for him to be in it. Yeah, so suddenly well, everything looked great for him again. <coughs> yeah. Um, and that happened. Well, just to briefly, what is, I mean, it's such a crazy story from what I've seen about that uh, uh, it'd be rather hard to encapsulate it, but uh, yes. maybe you can, because you're the man who started it. Well, I would hesitate to, and that's that. Yes, uh, well, Yellowbeard well, Just explain Yellowbeard. Right. right. He, he's, he, uh, I believe you're going to show a clip in a moment. With what Madeline Carr there? visiting you. That's yes. right, yes. Yeah. He has spent uh, 20 years in, in prison uh, for refusing to divulge the whereabouts of his treasure, and despite 20 years of torture and uh, unpleasantness, he still hasn't divulged the whereabouts, so... Uh, the, uh, the authorities hit on the idea of allowing him to escape and then following him. Uh -huh. That's the basis of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this little scene we're about to see, Madeleine Kahn, who is his, um, well, kind of half-wife, half rapey half really. He's a very <laughs> piratical person. And um, it comes to visit him and has something to explain to him. All right, uh, so let's join them. Do you remember just before you were arrested we were having a cuddle? I was raping you, if that's what you mean. <laughs> sort of half cuddle, half rape. Get on with it, woman. <laughs> well, I haven't told you this before because I wanted him to be brought up like a gentleman and not a pirate. Who are you talking about? The fruit of your loins, sugar drawers. <laughs> I haven't got fruit in my loins. Lice, yes, and proud of them. It means that we have spawned a son. Done what? You have just become the father of a 20-year-old bouncing boy called Dane. Ah, oh, a son. Takes after me, does he? Well... By the time I was 20, I'd killed 500 men. Well, he's not quite so extroverted as you. <laughs> he a thief? No. A rapist? No. Oh, bloody hell, I give up. What is he, then? He's a gardener. A gardener? A yellow-beard gardening? I'll see about that when I'm out. What is it now? Time's up, sir. So your son's a gardener, eh? <laughs> 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 oh, let's see it this way again. That's great. I hear people roaring, laughing as you go what, um, now, you're also involved in the last, in the most recent, I won't say last, Monty Python film called hmm. The Meaning of Life. Yes. Yeah, apparently that is uh, outrageous even by Monty Python standards, oh, or disgusting. The Meaning of Life standards. Yes. How yeah. disgusting. Oh, revolting. Uh, really <laughs> is. Uh, really grubby. Yes, uh, people, uh, we were considering uh, giving out uh, air sickness bags at, uh, <laughs> at uh, screenings, just in case. No, it is, it is quite revolting. Mm. <laughs> Quite yes, it is. Yeah. We, we had a problem with that, really. Uh, uh, it started, I suppose, because John Cleese and I, who uh, I suppose represent the more conservative side of the, the group of six of us, which is not particularly conservative, no. but uh, uh, we, we wrote a, a, a sketch quite early on in the genesis of this movie, uh, which was uh, a sex lecture uh, and a very overt uh, lecture, too, with a, a, a master explaining uh, sex uh, in, uh, to, to, the, to the kids, to the boys at school, who were more interested in watching the cricket out of the window. <laughs> and um, despite this very graphic description of, of sex and the sex act, in fact, demonstrated on the headmaster's wife. <laughs> uh, and um, having gone that far, we couldn't really tell the others, no, that, you know, we can't do that. No. So, so the floodgates were open, really, and <laughs> anything just went. And everyone just tried to top your grubbiness. That's right. Yeah. They were grubbier and grubbier. Mm. <laughs> it's been quite successful, so a lot of people don't mind being offended by the sound of it. Mm, no, no, it, it, it does offend, hopefully, everyone. <laughs> You'd almost guarantee that, would you? Yes, so that if you feel offended, at least they're being offended over there as well. <laughs> so no one in that theatre is feeling out of it. Well, what, what's it like when you all get together? Is there much bitchiness, much rivalry? I mean, much topping? I mean, oh, of course, mm. yes. <laughs> but um, we, we, we try to pretend that there isn't. No, no. Uh, it, 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 actually, we get on quite well, really. Uh, we're, we're, we're a little committee of people, and but, uh, but there are uh, occasional problems. I only remember one episode of Near Violence when... Mm -hmm. Uh, a very, very heavy glass ashtray uh, moved from the direction of Terry Jones towards the direction of John Cleese. But 
Uh, I think that just represented uh, the, the political poles of the group. Sure. It was a statement. It was part of a discussion. Yes. <laughs> the object was incidental. Yes. Oh, yeah. quite. It, it didn't Could hit anyone anything. anyway. No, no. Made a mess of the table, but... <laughs> <laughs> does, does Graham Chapman get to wear a frock in this one or not? Uh, no, unfortunately not. No, no. Uh, you no, yell a beard uh, all the way through, eh? Yes, he's he, uh, uh, rather a fierce and uh, un unpleasant character, which was a great change from playing uh, Brian in Life of Brian, actually. Yes. I quite yes. enjoyed that, being uh, outrageous and biting people's throats out. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. You must feel a lot better. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, Graham, good to see you again, and, and great success with the film. Uh, I know it opened very well at the weekend, and uh, it's called Yellow Beard, and it is a riot.